Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar on the White House's rejection of the acupuncture industry's petition for inclusion in Medicare reimbursement. Uh, and this will include a discussion on the required federal response uh, to the uh, rejection of the, of the petition. For those of you who have not done webinars before, there is audio and video uh, for the webinar. Uh, some folks have problems with their audio if they're not connected properly with their computers. Uh, if you do have a problem, refer back to your call-in number. Should you have any questions or comments during the course of the webinar, uh, your presenter will not be able to address those qu questions on an ongoing basis. Uh, if they're technical questions, they will not be able to be addressed uh, at all. Uh, we will be able to take questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, on your portal screen that you should have uh, on your computer, you'll see a section to ask questions. Uh, feel free to submit those at any time, and we will look at those uh, at the end of the webinar and address them accordingly. Uh, the webinar is going to be recorded today, so if there's something you miss or something you want to quote or something you want to capture, uh, we will have the recording available after the webinar. Uh, we'll put that up probably this afternoon uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the webinar will not be edited once it's posted. What you see here today uh, will be on the recording, uh, so there won't be any changes. There won't be revisions revisions and extensions of remarks, things like that. No. What we say here today is what it is recorded. Uh, standard disclaimers, as you would expect with any webinar, this is not legal advice, information is subject to change. Uh, if you do want to rely on any information in this webinar, uh, we suggest that you consult your attorney or get other legal advice. Uh, this webinar is for informational purposes only and should not be quoted or used as authoritative reference material. I will be your presenter today. Uh, my name is Mark Guymond. I am a, a registered federal lobbyist uh, and a registered state lobbyist. I've testified before the U.S. Congress and most of the uh, state legislatures and regulatory bodies. I am president of National Policy Group here in Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of folks seem to have questions about and who and what, what I am, and I'm trying to put some of those uh, rumors or myths uh, to rest today. Um, I am a lobbyist here in D.C. Uh, I also do association multi-management. I've been in lobbying and government affairs uh, since the 80s. I first started working on Capitol Hill uh, for Senator Pete Wilson of California uh, in the late 80s uh, and went into private practice as a lobbyist thereafter. Uh, I'm not related with any group in acupuncture. Uh, I am not being paid by any organization or any association or any group. Um, this is an experience that came out of looking at the acupuncture industry um, and seeing that it's essentially a nascent industry and has the opportunity to grow and become a powerful advocacy and lobbying voice. Um, and I'm not going to take any positions in this webinar. What I'm trying to do here today is present objectively information that's out there. Uh, this, in fact, did occur. These are the implications of it. This is what can be done to help it or not help it. Uh, I'm not going to take any positions. Uh, hopefully you won't be disappointed by that. Uh, this will just be an, a fair examination of the policy apparatus and mechanisms that are uh, out there today. Um, one of the things that the people have been asking me is, is why are you doing this? Um, I, I saw the industry at a point where it is essentially at a policy void. There, there are so many things happening on the federal level and on the state level with this industry. Uh, that it, it didn't have a cohesive national voice. Uh, and there were some things that I thought the industry could do to, to better serve its interests. Um, for those of you that have been following the, the publications that we've been putting out, in December we put out the 2013 legislative summary. Uh, I thought it was significant um, that there was no, no common reference document for everyone to say, what are the, what are the other states doing? Uh, one of the things that, that happens so often in state legislation is what's happening in your sister state is important to them, that could cross over into your state or other states. So what is happening someplace else could be happening to you down the road. And that could be favorable. It could also be negative. Um, but, I, but I wasn't seeing in this industry that there was the opportunity for a state to have a reference to another state to see what was going on. There's legislation introduced all the time. There's law changes all the time. But there was not any cohesive national instrument for that. Uh, so we put together the 2013 legislative summary. Uh, some of you may have also received the acupuncture state law summary, uh, a, a huge document, massive undertaking. Uh, but this came out of 
a need what we saw on the student side. Uh, let me just say as, as a matter of, of disclaimer uh, that my wife is a, an acupuncture student uh, here in Maryland and she will be graduating uh, within a couple months and entering into private practice. And when I was speaking with her and, and her classmates and others, including some of the instructors, folks wanted to know what if they leave Maryland? What if they go to California or Texas or New York or whatever any other state might be? Uh, and what were the state laws there? And the, the choices that they had were to pull up the state statute, well, first find it, pull it up, and then try to analyze it. Um, so as, as something to help the students, I put together the state law summary, um, and it guided them better so that they could look from state to state and see what the general requirements are, rather than having to go through and do a formal analysis of a state law. Um, we thought this was extremely helpful. and. After we started the project, uh, when I was working with some of the state regulators, uh, the state regulators were asking if they could have a copy of the document when it was done as well. And then I saw a need to extend that further probably to legislators, that if you were having a legislative issue in one state, could this document be used to provide it to legislators and say, okay, we're going to use this in, as a comparison measure. Uh, and that is how this document has now had its, its genesis and development. And it's now gone out to the industry, and we're still getting in uh, corrections, modifications, additions, so that we can take this in a couple months and introduce a final document to the entire industry that's good for practitioners, for students, for regulators, it could be vendors, legislators, anybody. But here's the comprehensive evaluation of all the state laws so that it's easy to understand and doesn't require going out with an attorney or a legal analysis to try to figure out uh, what's happening <clears throat> in any other place. Excuse me. Um, what are my goals in doing all this? Uh, you know, not everything's altruistic in life. Uh, I am trying to advocate for the industry uh, and what I've done in the past with these documents and, and this webinar and, and future webinars and, and things of this nature is to simply show what could be done with this industry and what can be done for this industry. How do we take a, a loose confederation of practitioners and, and educators and everybody else and bring them together to be a cohesive national voice. This is a large enough industry that it should have a powerful voice in advocacy, but it just hasn't gotten to that point. And one of my goals is to try to help this industry do this. Is this business development? Absolutely. Is this altruistic? Partially. It's good for everybody. There's no downside to this. So. I guess my uh, bottom line is, if, if you like what I can do for free, just imagine what I could do if I were getting paid. All right, enough for the sales pitch there, if there ever was one. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to find out about me. You know, if, if people have questions, who is Mark Guyman and why is he doing this and, and all the other things, I think I've pretty fairly described what my motivations are and how I hope this industry can uh, use my services and, and change and benefit. Uh, Come join me on LinkedIn. It gives a little bit about my background. I've got videos up there of my testimony for the states, um, some of the work that I've done. Uh, I'm going to test the age of the audience here real quick and see how many of you remember when you could only drive 55 miles per hour in this country. Uh, you see on LinkedIn, part of my work uh, was to repeal the 55 mile an hour speed limit years ago and thus allow the states to set their limits and, and increase that above 55 if they chose to. Yes, that clearly ages me, but it's probably the most vivid example of what people would actually remember uh, and understand um, about my legislative work in the past. Okay, we're going to go into the, the history of, of this particular issue now. Um, and, and while I think the value of understanding what's happened with the, uh, the Medicare petition is important, I think there's a side bar that needs to be discussed too, and that is the value of this webinar is not just about the subject matter. The, one of the values of this webinar is bringing the industry together to have a common discussion, to debate, to analyze, to look at issues, and try to come together perhaps as an industry in resolving those issues and moving forward. Uh, so this is going to be just a straightforward history lesson on this particular issue, but I think you as an industry and its members want to look at this from a larger perspective, and that is how does the industry take this uh, and, and work with it. The, the general proposition that we're dealing with today was a, a petition uh, that was registered with WhiteHouse.gov uh, on behalf of the acupuncture industry. Um, and the goal of that 
petition essentially was to recognize acupuncturists as healthcare providers and to be paid by Medicare for therapy management. Uh, that's a direct quote from the, uh, from the petition itself. Uh, I can't say that it was, it was a bad effort. Uh, 31,000 signatures is very respectable for a, a White House petition. Uh, one of the problems, though, with the uh, White House petition is it's just a petition. It is, is asking for action. It does not require it. Um, we have the right under the Constitution to petition for the redress of grievances. Uh, that does not mean that the government has to take that, that petition and, and act upon it. Um, you know, they don't have to redress the grievances if they don't want to. It's their choice. Uh, ultimately, what happened was the White House issued a response for that uh, particular petition. Uh, in essence, the White House did not adopt the position of the industry and the folks that created the petition, uh, and then issued, uh, in response to that, the official White House response. Uh, and I'm going to go through this so you don't really need to, to look at it all that carefully on this screen. Um, but keep in mind, the sections that I've highlighted here coming up, are the official responses from the Obama administration for the, uh, the particular petition. Uh, the, the, the first significant quote here is, acupuncturists are not recognized in the Social Security Act as healthcare providers who are authorized to bill and receive payment for the services from Medicare. Uh, pretty straightforward. I think everybody knows that, uh, but that's the general proposition. Um, And it goes into the term providers defined in Medicare regulations, includes hospitals, nursing facilities, others. It does not include specifically acupuncturists. Um, again, I think it's pretty well known to everybody, but it probably is good background for the administration to have included in their, uh, their response. Um, and it goes into other non-physician practitioners who are uh, able to receive payment for uh, services under Medicare, uh, going for, again, the detail of, of who and why. Um, now we start to get into the meat of the issue, and that is acupuncture is not a covered benefit. You know that. And the administration is now saying to cover acupuncture would require a change in statute or a change in the uh, national coverage determination. Uh, again, buttressing the previous point, the overall scope of covered and non-covered benefits under the Medicare, pro Medicare program is prescribed by law. And then finally, I think one of the, uh, the more pertinent statements, the conclusion, if you will, uh, after careful study of the available evidence, it was concluded that acupuncture is not reasonable and necessary. Therefore, national non-coverage for acupuncture continues. Uh, I think the most common statement there is that national non-coverage for acupuncture continues. The petition and the rejection hasn't changed anything. We're still at the status quo, but the administration has outlined at least their reasoning and rationale for, for why that status uh, will continue, the non-coverage will continue. So in, in reading the administration's response, uh, I think that there is, we'll bifurcate this particular paragraph and look at the, the relevant areas, but there are two things uh, that the industry should be concerned with in particular. The first is to get a change in the status of acupuncture with, with Medicare would require a change in statute or a change in the CMS national coverage uh, determination, the NCD. Uh, if we look at the latter part first, the who can the national coverage determination and who can make that change. Uh, in, I've had uh, emails with the uh, CMS uh, office, and apparently these are the folks here. Jonathan Blum's the principal administrator for the office. Uh, his office would have the authority to make that, that change should they see fit. Um, the, the current position of that office as it is right now uh, might not be all that sympathetic to that, that to the industry's position. Um, and this is what they say about acupuncture at this point and the national coverage determination uh, currently. Until the pending scientific assessment of the te technique has been completed and its efficacy has been established, so on and so forth, basically saying at this point that the CMS does not have the scientific background and, and determination that it needs to say that acupuncture is an effective uh, service to be covered under Medicare. Um, and then, of course, continuing acupuncture is not considered reasonable and necessary uh, within the meaning of the Social Security Act. Uh, it, it raises questions about what, what needs to be done. Regardless of whether or not Medicare coverage is good or bad, if, if the industry wants to participate that in, in that, I think there's a huge statement there that, that discusses what the industry needs to do to, to elevate its, its practice and its view uh, in the scientific community. Uh, if, if Medicare is not viewing acupuncture as a, a 
scientifically valid technique, there needs to be a massive education effort there. Um, moving into what actually can be done realistically, uh, should the industry want to participate in Medicare, um, the, the real test is to go to Congress. Uh, and I've included this particular slide here with the photograph, uh, just to remind everybody what the climate is in, in Congress these days and the number of bills that are actually getting through. Um, it's few and far between. Um, but if there was a desired change in Medicare, the more reasonable route of the two would certainly seem to be a legislative response uh, through the U.S. Congress. Um, at this moment in time, there is an existing bill uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, H.R. 3799, the Federal Acupuncture Coverage Act of 2013. Um, it was introduced just about a, a month ago. Uh, the bill has no co-sponsors. It's a standalone. And it has been referred to three different committees. Uh, Representative Gibson of New York was the sponsor of the bill. Uh, and he's going to have to get it through those th three committees uh, if it's going to have any future uh, and, and see the floor of the House and then go over to the Senate. Uh, I don't want to go into all the legislative procedures, but a bill with no co-sponsors going through a committee referral system uh, is going to have a long and arduous duty. Um, it, it seemingly, I would put it in, on the scale of probably not possible, um, but the goal, if this bill were to have a life, would be to increase the number of co-sponsors and find a large number of co-sponsors who are on the relevant committees of jurisdiction. Um, not unlikely, there have been acupuncture bills in the past uh, that had almost as many as, as 50 uh, co-sponsors. Uh, and they were from throughout the United States, from, from both parties. It was a good bipartisan bill. Uh, that could be done. Uh, to do that requires a lot of work, um, and it's not just hoping and praying. It is literally burning shoe leather on the hill to make sure that it happens. Uh, the purpose of the bill of 3799 is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, it's to bring acupuncture into Medicare and the uh, Federal Employee Health Benefit Program, the FEHBP. Uh, I think there's a larger issue here, too, that, that has been overlooked, perhaps, um, and, and that is, what, what other programs are there available? Why just limit it to this? We could also be looking at TRICARE. Um, there may be an expansion into, not just through this bill, but through others, for state employee programs. Uh, you know, is this bill self-limiting? Or is this exactly where it needs to be? I don't know. That, that's an industry choice. Uh, but certainly, my, my role is to simply identify this as an issue and, and have people discuss it um, and bring it forward. Um, this is the qualified acupuncturist definition in the in the act, and I'm going to highlight certain sections of this. So just take a general overview, uh, if you will. Um, the first thing that the bill talks about is th those that would be able to re be reimbursed through Medicare or FEHPP would be a qualified acupuncturist or a qualified acupuncture service, exactly. Um, and and uh, I've been a lobbyist on the federal level and the state level. For a lot of years, I've literally had hundreds of bills either killed or enacted uh, over that time. Um, I'm pretty good at legislative drafting, and I have to say I'm not really sure I know what qualified acupuncture services means from a technical standpoint. Um, it's, it's, in my mind, it's an undefined term. Uh, if we look to the state laws, there are a variety of definitions about what acupuncture means, what's the scope of practice, all of these different things. But you have, let me go back for a second, uh, in the federal bill, an, uh, an undefined term. I don't, it doesn't say what a qualified acupuncturist is. It just says, if you're this, you can, you can uh, be reimbursed. Uh, so we go to the various state laws, look at those. Is there a commonality necessarily in, in those definitions? There probably is that could be drawn together, but the federal law might apply to one state and have a completely different meaning in another state based on the definitions of the state laws, and the state law summary is a beautiful reference tool for this if you have it, is, is take a moment just to go through each state and look at the definition of, of acupuncture. And there's also a subheading under that for scope of practice. And it, it gives us a general theme of what the industry is, but it doesn't actually define what exactly it is. It's going to vary state by state, so while you may have an acupuncture practice in one state that's one thing, it could be completely different in another based on the, on the state law. Uh, and I would, I would note just for 
clarification here that you take something like acupuncture in Arizona. It's the very top of the screen there, you see what it means. But Arizona is now looking at legislation, I mean right now, that changes the definition of acupuncture in their state. So even if something were to happen, <laughs> it goes through as is, it could change on a state level on a moment's notice. And one of the issues that I have is, does the state know what the federal government's doing? If if 3790, House Bill 3799 were to go through, could that impact the, the legislative future of that bill in Arizona? It should. Somebody in Arizona should be looking to that federal bill, and somebody on the federal side should be looking to the state bill, matching up those, those terms. Um, it, it, to me, it's, it, it's just basic legislative drafting, but it's so, so important um, that it really needs to be done on an ongoing basis on a unified level, not just a, a 50 states plus the District of Columbia and the territories all kind of doing their own thing and hoping that everything meshes. There are implications. There's a, there is a policy matrix here uh, that th this all applies to. Uh, some of the concerns uh, that I've, I've raised from folks uh, in, in terms of the qualified acupuncturists, what does it mean? Are you, are you qualified acupuncturists to be doing dry needling? Is it, is it detox? Uh, some of the scope of practice include massage and herbs. What exactly is the qualified acupuncturist? And since 3799 doesn't define it, it could be many, many different things. Uh, and that creates a, a, an amount of ambiguity in law uh, that is not beneficial to, to anybody. Um, so I think if you look at the scope of what needs to be done, there, sh there should probably be a, a better definition uh, in something like 3799 as to what they are actually calling a, a qualified acupuncturist than the acupuncturist services. Um, the bill also goes on to, in terms of what qualified acupuncturist means as one who is certified, licensed, or registered as an acupuncturist by a state. Um, I think the obvious challenges of that is what if you have a state that does not specifically certify, license, or register? Um, if you're in, in Kansas, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, or Wyoming, and you're practicing, you're not going to be certified, licensed, or registered. Uh, so, so where do you go with that? Uh, this bill could potentially exclude those particular acupuncturists just by virtue of their, their geography. So I think there's some, there's some areas of concern that aren't necessarily negative or positive, but if somebody addresses them, it creates a better policy uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I've also had some commentary on, on whether or not the uh, federal bill should have an opt-out provision. Uh, again, I'm not here today to, to give my opinion one way or the other about what should be in a bill or not in a bill. That's, that's for your, your industry leaders to decide. Um, but I think it is relevant for the industry as a whole to have the discussion uh, about all of this. So we get through at the end of the day, the, the Obama administration has rejected the petition, kind of expected that. There's no change, everything's status quo. So what do we do? To change the statute, there is only one thing that can be done, and that is lobby the Congress. That is develop a bill, have hearings on it, have it passed, have it become law. Um, that is a huge undertaking. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and it takes a, a lot of skill. Uh, you need people who are familiar with the process and can get things done. Um, it's not really going to change any other way. I think the, the industry needs to be cognizant of the challenges and say, you know, one, does the industry want to worry about Medicare reimbursement? If yes, this is the action to follow. Uh, if no, the status quo uh, will stay as exact, exactly it is, as it is, so there's no need to, uh, to worry about change at that point. Um, so that really comes up as the, at the end of the webinar. Um, the goal was to familiarize everybody with the issue. There was little media coverage of this issue. Uh, there was little information uh, exchange around the industry. Uh, I, I was hopeful that people would look at this and get the information that they needed. Um, I will be doing a, another webinar next uh, Wednesday um, on the subject of, of state laws. Uh, again, information sharing with the industry. There was a, an extremely notable state legislative event that occurred just days ago uh, that I haven't heard anybody talk about in the industry. Um, and it may be good, it may be bad, depending on how you, how you look at it. Uh, but if you don't know about it, you're never going to be able to do anything. If it's good, it'll just stay there. If it's bad, it'll just stay there. And again, state legislation to me is if you have something that's bad, 
it has a tendency to overflow into other states and that could directly impact a practitioner on a daily basis in a negative way. That being said, good legislation also has a tendency to move around, but you want to move the, the good and kill the bad. Um, so next week's webinar, we'll be discussing the, the current state laws, the legislative opportunities that, that are there with those states, um, and I'll be exploring some of the, uh, the current legislation that's out there. Um, if you're not following the state legislation that's been introduced, um, you should. Uh, I don't know if there's any sources out there other than what we're putting out, uh, but there's a bills introduced literally every day, uh, and some of them are, are important. Some of them are teeny little changes that are technical in nature only in the state laws, um, but you should probably want to know. Uh, and I will say this as a state lobbyist for more than 20 years. Even if you have a bill that starts out as just a tiny little technical change in a bill that can always be amended and grow into something that you had no expectation would be there. A, a, it can snowball out of control literally in a moment's notice. And on the state level, you could have a bill introduced on a Tuesday. If you go to committee on, say, Friday or the next Monday, it could be amended, go out of committee that day or the next, and be on the floor within weeks. State legislation moves that fast. So next week, next Wednesday, I'll send out the information for the webinar. But there's something that happened, and if you don't know about it, you should know about it. Uh, and I hope that you will join us for, for the webinar. Um, and we will give a national perspective on state legislative agendas. Uh, that will be next Wednesday, again, at 1 o'clock Eastern time. Um, and I hope you'll join us for it. Um, that's it. I appreciate everyone attending today. Uh, I hope you weren't disappointed and that you were expecting me to give my opinion on everything because that's not what this is about. This is purely informational, uh, and I think we achieved that today, that it, I've given you something to think about, uh, and hopefully that can better the industry and help out all the practitioners um, and get this industry going in a, in a positive direction in terms of its public policy goals. Uh, my name is Mark Diamond. Uh, if you need me, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email them to me. Um, if there are any questions right now, if anybody has that would like to be addressed, uh, I'd be more than happy to take them. Um, let's see. I, I do have a couple questions here. Bear with me. Uh, okay, I'm getting some information. State law summary was great, though. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. Are you familiar with the draft legislation to get acupuncture covered under Medicare? Um, I think that was that was addressed. Yeah, that would be 3799. Um, if you have any more detailed questions about that, absolutely. The bill is extremely straightforward. I mean, it's very easy to understand. Uh, I would I would say this too, um, Congressman Gibson. Uh, there were there were no press releases. There were no dear colleague letters. There were none of the information that goes along with with legislation to suggest that this is going to be a, a larger bill. It, was probably introduced as a favor to somebody, which, which is common. I, I think it's great practice. I can't fault him for that. Um, but we need to be there as, a, as policy folks uh, to help those kind of bills along. Um, you know, and that, that's what we do professionally. Um, is there a problem that BLS does not have a definition for acupuncture? Um, I, 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 th I think so. Uh, I don't know that in terms of, of BLS that it's, it's absolutely necessary. Um, I think it would be beneficial to the industry to have their own designation, but for terms of things like comparative to OSHA standards and things like that, I don't think it's any different than, than any other professional capacity. Um, and I'm talking a very technical term, not a not a reflection of the individual practitioner and their abilities. Um, let's see. We have um, NCC. NCC AOM certification is generally accepted as a definition of what a qualified acupuncture, acupuncturist is. Um, I'm going to say yes and no. Uh, if you look at the state laws, state laws require it as a condition of, of licensing, but that is not what the definition of an acupuncturist is. Um, a, a acupuncturist is going to be defined as somebody who has had requisite education and uh, certification. Uh, in terms of, of examination, uh, but the qualified acupuncturist is a state-granted substance. It's not the NCCAOM. NCCAOM grants the, the certificate, uh, the diploma uh, of qualification, but the state ultimately decides what the qualified acupuncturist is. The NCCAOM requirement is simply a part of 
many different things that go into it. The state decides what a qualified acupuncturist is, and that is based on their state law definition and their scope of practice, which could be both statutory and regulatory. Um, what is meant by an opt-out provision? Um, that was something that somebody had talked about. What if, what if they don't want to participate in, in Medicare? Uh, what are the implications of that? Is there, it does that? Does that harm a practitioner later on? Or what if they start in Medicare and they choose not to do Medicare later on? Um, I think the, the opt-out provision in that respect was it was really targeted to if I, if I am allowed to participate in Medicare and it's not beneficial and I stop participating in Medicare, what is that going to do for, for my practice? So I believe that is the, the scope of what was looked at in the, uh, in the, um, in that provision. Um, let's see. I have another question. Could you use NCCOM certification as a national qualification to, to qualify qualified practitioners? Um, yes, to a certain extent. Uh, I think the, the, the language in 3799 as it's drafted right now is adequate to a point. Uh, and that point is the bill says those that are certified, qualified, licensed in those states that have that kind of, uh, that kind of process, which most do. If we look at those states that don't have any licensing certification, something like an NCCOM status, uh, the deployment status, could be used as an alternative to, to that. Um, so I think the, the, there is the opportunity to address those, those additional states that don't have the licensing certification registration requirements and try to fix something in there. Um, it is not currently in the bill, so I think the, the inherent problem is that would have to be added, uh, and there's probably some kind of, of good language that the, uh, the industry could develop with that. Um, what, what steps could the industry take to begin the process to have a cohesive lobby presence? Um, <laughs> my, my first answer is you get a lobbyist. Um, uh, that was terribly self-serving, and I apologize. Uh, I think the reality is the industry needs to come together. Um, some of the things that I've tried to do with the with the publications is keep you apprised of what's happening on the state level. For example, with legislation, um, and this this came out of my wife's experience as a student was she's going to be in practice coming up. Her friends are going to be in practice. I, I've met her professors and others, and what are the challenges that they faced and Creating, creating an information flow. One, what's happening on the state level? I, I, know, I know within a moment, I can push a button on my computer and I have information as to what state laws have been introduced literally within an hour ago. My systems are that good. I do that all the time, not only for, for acupuncture now, but for, for other industries, and I, I keep them apprised. Legislative tracking is, is one of the key, key elements. Um, and having an understanding of what's going on state A and state B and state C, and working together as an industry, not as just the folk in this state or this state, but looking to your sister state and saying, how can I help, you know, if I'm next to a state, can I go over and testify? Can I write a letter to a legislator? Can I be a part of the overall discussion, even if it doesn't necessarily involve my particular state? And that is the, the creation of a whole perspective for, for the industry, that it's not just the states. This is a national industry that needs a national presence. Um, and that would be one of the steps. And then, of course, deciding if you have draft language, what to do with that draft language, how you want to introduce it, where do you want to go with it. Um, start small. There are several bills that are pending in the, in the states that could be a very good test for this industry to come together and, and be cohesive, be a grassroots force. Um, you know, one of the things you want to be is a powerful voice. Some of the other industries that I've seen, that it, it, you're actually competing with are doing very well in terms of their legislative presence. Uh, they're, they're organized, they're cohesive, they're, they're powerful because they have the message and they all go for it. Um, this is not just a loose coalition of, of practitioners. This needs to be an industry. Uh, and having that industry as a whole would make it a, a lobbying force. Um, the, the other natural conclusions are you, you, you need somebody to lobby on your behalf on, on the Hill. Um, I mean, that's just reality, uh, and it needs to start. There's no reason to, to delay that process. You have a bill that can be moving. That bill could easily be amended. Uh, it's going to have to go through subcommittee and, and committee hearings. Uh, you know, 
federal legislation moves at a very, very slow and deliberate place. It is the pace. It is designed to be the slowest thing ever, basically so that the whims and passions of the public do not go about changing the law uh, in an adversarial way. Um, so even though there's a bill, it could take a long time. There's bills been pending since 1993, apparently. Um, it's, it's a question of what, what do you want to do with it? Is it time to actually get together behind, behind it as an, as an industry and move it? Um, I, I would say they use these states as a uh, potential, as a test area. Um, and, let's, and we have another one. Uh, the question is generally about the inclusion of, of acupuncture uh, in, in private medical insurance. Um, I, I think one of the things you need to look at is the, well, first off, with, with, the, uh, with the ACA, um, the essential health benefits is how do you expand the scope of essential health benefits and have acupuncture included uh, more and more uh, on the state level um, at that point. And then the private insurance companies, too, is what is their motivation? Does it cut costs? How do you convince the insurance companies to to engage uh, voluntarily in including including acupuncture, uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to sometimes it, you know, if, if the if the federal government is saying they're not sure about the impact and the effectiveness of, of acupuncture, insurance companies are probably taking that same lead, and it needs to be a, a cohesive educational effort to, to change that. Um, but I think there are things that, that can certainly be done. Um, Immediately, and that is is working with the states uh, on the on the essential health benefits, the HBs, uh, and then start looking too. You know, why limit thirty seven ninety nine to Medicare and uh, FEHBB? Uh, let's throw in Tricare. Let's throw in anything else that can be too. Um, you know, the more the merrier. And quite honestly, if you're going to go through the effort and time, trouble, and expense as an industry of pushing something like House Bill thirty seven ninety nine, it should be as inclusive as possible with every single thing that you can get in there. Uh, so that doesn't leave uh, certain areas out. You want the most bang for the buck, I guess, is the uh, is the bottom line with that. And it looks like we have come to the end of questions. Uh, I appreciate the uh, questions and, and the participation, and I thank you all. And I hope that you will join us for the webinar next week, next Wednesday. Thank you.